there are legislative committees that are going on right now, and as we were talking about this annual conference, the question came up, well, what are people going to do who aren't in the legislative committees or don't want to be in the legislative committees? And someone said, well, I guess they can just kind of hang out. And I said, or perhaps we can offer something to help equip our church to reach new people. And uh, I am thankful that the cabinet and the committee on annual conference was generous enough to allow this time for the Center for Church Development for us to talk about how do we lower the barriers in between our church and new people, our persons in the mission field. So again, I'm grateful that you are here. Uh, we're going to be doing some interaction, and so uh, be ready to shout out some answers. And as we're getting started, let's, uh, I want to ask you uh, to join me in prayer. Merciful God, we do thank you for this, uh, this time to be gathered here and that we've, we're just setting aside, Lord. And, and we say a special prayer for those who are, Lord, just uh, feeling lonely, feeling that no one cares. Lord, those who are struggling with their, their family issues, those, Lord, that are, are, are seeking direction, who have a hole, Lord, in their life that that only you can feel. Lord, we come here as, as your servants, as your body, as your light, as your salt. Lord, we come asking you to utilize us, utilize us to reach people with your good news and with your love. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my name is Owen Ross. I am the director for the Center for Church Development. And I also, one time a week, get the privilege of teaching evangelism at Perkins School of Theology. And I always start off with the class that says, what do you really think about evangelism, really? And it's interesting the answers I get back. But as we go through our class we, and we get to the root that evangelism just is sharing good news. I remember my grandfather reading the paper. He read the Austin American Statesman every day. And I remember asking him one day, any good news? And his response without looking up from the paper was, not in here. <laughs> Which was also his way of saying, there is good news. But it's not on the 24-hour news cycle. And that is what we are being bombarded with and people are being bombarded with. And that's why we see, we see resentment, we see anger, we see division, we see loneliness going up on the rise. Meanwhile, God has set aside and called a group of people and have given us good news that the world desperately needs today. We heard it last night proclaimed in the sermon. We've heard it in the various reports today. We've heard it in conversations with one another. We'll go to the next slide. But the world just seems to getting to be more and more effective about separating us from those who are in need of the good news. And let's go to the next slide. What are some of those barriers that are preventing people from connecting with the church, preventing people from hearing the good news. Go ahead and shout it out. Politics, good answer. Others. Poverty, Poverty. others. Hunger, others. Apathy. There's schedules. I was waiting as, as a parent of young kids, Sunday morning activities. When did that become a thing? When I was growing up, nothing happened on Sunday morning. There was no sports. There's a lot of competition on people's schedule, especially when the church is accustomed to doing what we do. Other barriers. Racism. Prejudices. Prejudices against Christians. What they think that we believe or what they think we think about them. People will say, I already feel bad about myself. Why would I want to go to church and feel worse? <laughs> so there's a lot of things that are just barriers between us and those who we are called to reach and serve. We'll go to the next slide. 
Now I want you to imagine for a second that you are a tomato ketchup factory. And you wanted to get your product into the hands of those who need tomato ketchup. You're the factory. Where would you want to get your tomato ketchup so that those who need tomato ketchup can get it? Where would you want to put it? Shout out the answer. Where? At eye level where? In the stores. You want them in the stores. Eye level. Where else do you want your ketchup? Where they sell hot dogs. Where they sell french fries. Any of the restaurants. So what I want us to notice here is we, if we were ketchup entrepreneurs, we know how to get our product to those who need it. Meanwhile, as the church, we tend to wait for people to come to the factory. Are you, are you, are you catching? The church is, is supposed to be the factory, and we send our product out to those who need it. But we tend to operate as, if you want our product, you got to come to the factory between 10.30 and 11.30. We're open one hour a week <laughs> on Sundays, and that's how you get our product. So what we are seeking to do, you know, for so long the church, we, we kept thinking of how can we get a funnel to get people in the church, but what we are doing now is we're, how do we get a funnel to get our people out of the church and out to where people are in need of the good news of Jesus Christ. We'll go to the next slide. So if you've not signed the planting pledge, please do so. This is the I am committing to start of attempting, and we use the attempt word, because when Jesus talked about scattering seeds, not all the seeds bore fruit. And I found it fascinating that the people that Jesus incarnate trained, when Jesus sent them out, Jesus said, and when you fail, or when they don't receive the message, you do this. And I'm like, what do you mean? You trained them. We're going to try a lot of things that aren't going to work. Those that Jesus incarnate trained tried some things that didn't work. And I think Jesus sent them out two by two because when they left that town, dusted their sandals, they looked to each other and said, okay, what are we going to do different in the next town? So sign the planting pledge. We want, and it's just saying I will attempt at least one new thing between now annual conference and next annual conference to disciple people we're not already discipling. All right, next slide. So those who garden, and again, if you sign that pledge, you get a, a, a daisy that's donated by Cultivate Ministry. People who garden know that if you're going to, you have to adjust what you plant to the types of soil that you have. Because not all plants grow in the same types of soil. This is important for us with, with our church planting, or, and, that's, and that's what we call any new ministry that you're going out to try to reach new people to do, is all church planting is contextual. You're trying to reach people where they are in their culture, and you have to do it in culturally uh, effective ways. Language is part of our culture, and if you go to a person who, who don't speak uh, um, uh, Spanish, and you, start to, and you try to start a Spanish ministry among people who don't know Spanish, you're probably not going to be very effective. So taking into mind the culture that you're going into is, is essential for our church planting. And we'll go to the next slide now. So what I'm going to give now, and this is going to be the crux of what we're talking about, is four ways to lower the barriers between your church and the people that you're trying to reach. And so the first suggestion I have is go where people are already present. If you want to reach people, ask where people are already gathering in your community, why they are gathering, how they are gathering, and how might you connect with those persons where they are already gathering. And I'm going to share three examples from our conference. Let's go to the next slide. we got First United Methodist Church, Capel. So there's a huge development that's going in south. It's, it's actually Dallas, but it's 
it feels more like South Capel, which is Cypress Waters. There are thousands of people moving into this community. A sliver of them may drive up and come to a Sunday morning service at Capel. But First Capel is trying to reach them where they are. And so they did a big event there in, in December doing a concert, but the whole purpose of doing the big event in that community is they want to get people registered for an alpha program, which is a, which is, is a seekers type Bible study type program that was going to be held there in the, their community. Oftentimes, churches do a big outreach event, but what's lacking is that follow-up disciple, discipleship pathway. So where can people get connected to something in their community so that they can be discipled? Now, some people may work their way and find themselves into the congregation at First Capel. For others, this is going to be the only place where they receive community, where they receive good news, uh, where they receive discipleship. And we have to say, that is okay. Not everyone in the Methodist class meetings were a part of the societies. Are you with me? The next one, St. Luke Community. St. Luke Community took their Easter service out of their sanctuary and they held it in a community. And everything that they were doing the whole time as they were doing worship is doing various announcements to seek to provide different ministries and to connect people that, that were at Clyde Warren Park on an Easter Sunday morning. Again, go where people already are. And seeking to connect them with the ministries of the church and trying to connect the ministries of the church with people who aren't already in their community. And you can see that's me and my boys who really enjoyed Easter morning there at Clyde Warren Park. All right, and the next one. This is uh, through Christ Foundry, and hopefully it's a video that will play with sound. And, and it's probably not. And so it's called Festy Kids. So Festy Kids is a ministry of Christ Foundry United Methodist Mission where they are going into apartment complexes, and in that apartment complexes, they are basically throwing children's fiestas. Now, Christ Foundry has an excellent Wednesday night children's fiesta program. But they were finding that there were lots of kids that weren't coming to their church on Wednesday night. So they decided to take the church to the apartments on Saturday mornings. They would get members of the church, they would go out and they would have a, an event, they would put on puppet shows, they would share the good news of the gospel with the children, but at the same time, a cadre of adults were sitting there talking to the parents and talking to them about the ministries and what they were hoping to do is find some people that they could go back and visit and eventually start a cell group. We just met with the Latino pastors for lunch, and we went around and we, we shared our names, where we serve, and what gives you hope. And what Pastor Amy Spore of Christ Foundry shared, it says, what gives me hope is our home groups. People with busy schedules are showing up with their books, having studied before they got there, and having answered their questions. That although we are dealing with a very busy society, there's still a deep hunger for spiritual nourishment. And church, we are the only entity that is organized to do Wesleyan discipleship, Wesleyan spiritual formation that's out there. We need to continue with our social services. We need to continue with our educational services. But we cannot neglect the spiritual services that we have been charged with because our world needs it. So the next thing, so one th the next uh, slide uh, after going where people go. Now, I want to ask you a question. What are some examples of Jesus going to where people already are or where the Methodists went to where people already are? That's an easy question. Let's shout out some answers. The circuit riders. They were going where people were. Others? The field preaching. Going to the mines. Going where people were working and they were preaching. Others? Jesus at the wedding. Uh, Others, Methodists going to hospitals and to prisons. 
Uh, Matt Temple is going to write a book called Guesting. It says, the church, we have been great at hosting for years. But when we see Jesus, so often we see Jesus in other people's parties. So can we as a church learn how to be guests in other people's parties so that we can minister to them in their space and on their time? So guesting. Next slide. Oh, where do you tend to find people gathering in your mission field? That's a question for you to take back to your church. Next. Second one is add discipleship to ministries that already reach new people, such as your social services. Now, when I say your social services, this could be your school that you have in, your day care, your daycare, um, adding additional spiritual services for those, for those families. The example I have is uh, Glen Oaks. So Glen Oaks United Methodist uh, Church in South Dallas had a, had a feeding ministry, and they were giving away fresh fruits and vegetables. A young man showed up one time, and he picked up this acorn squash, and he asked one of the, the saints of Glen Oaks and says, what do I do with this? Which I would do the same. And she says, well, come on in here, honey, and let me show you. And he did. And he came in the kitchen, and she took some of the ingredients from that day's food and, and made a meal with this young man. And so they decided, why not once a month, let's take some of the, the, the produce that we're, that we're giving away, and let's have a cooking class with those ingredients, and then let's have a communion meal. Remember, the original communion just wasn't a, a, a wafer and a cup. It was a full meal. Said, so let's have a communion meal on our food distribution Saturdays. So, sp spiritual services, there are those churches that are like, ah, you don't need to bother with the social services. You know, we need to just focus on the spiritual. And like, well, that's not us as United Methodist. If anything, we can err too far on, we're going to give you the the soup and the school supplies but the spiritual food is for us are you with me keeping those united is how christ did it keeping those united is how how wesley did it and i believe it's essential for us to be able to to extend our most valuable gift as we are extending our other services so the next idea the third one okay Again, there are examples that Jesus is going. We'll go to our third one. And I see uh, Pastor Peter McNabb, who's the pastor of First United Methodist Church of Terrell. First United Methodist Church of Terrell had a grief group. You may have grief groups in your, in your church or other, uh, uh, other kind of types of support group. Well, um, uh, Peter got a grant from the Center for Church Development to convert their church's grief group into a community grief group and he wanted some money to put an ad in the paper about community grief group and we'll go to the next slide and you can see them community grief group it's not our church's grief group it's the community grief group and peter can tell you more about it uh, you could catch him on break peter will you stand up so you can, catch, you can catch him on the break, and he can tell you more about this and how they did it. But, thank you. but he'd tell me, you know, they had Baptists, they had Pentecostals, you know, all sorts of people that were showing up, you know, especially during the COVID season. And he said, but they also had some people who had no church home. And there were also people who made First United Methodist Church Terrell their church home as a result of that. And so I, I invite you to go through your, your church ministries that you have. Could any of those be reframed, be reoriented, and then relaunched as a community ministry to reach those that you're not already reaching? Yes, you may end up discipling some other people's disciples, but that's not the worst thing. But I also have seen in Terrell how God has used such a ministry to reach people that the church was not already reaching. All right, in our next slide. So the last one is to convert congregational ministries. Okay, uh, we already did that. And going to the fourth one. And the last one is working with what you have instead of what you wish you had. 
So I was in ministry in a very low-income community for 15 years in La Fundición de Cristo. And we really had to work with what we have because we could be paralyzed in that if we only had this, if we only had this. And in conversations with various churches, I see them too feeling paralyzed. Well, if we only had this, if we only had this. I had one pastor tell me, and I'm not going to call this person out, and they said, we have nothing to offer children. And I said, you are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please don't ever say that again. Because we have very, very valuable things to offer children and families. Have we discovered how to do them here? Maybe not. Maybe there's some work that needs to be done, but we still have a lot to offer. So there's a church, I'll go to the next slide, in, in rural East Texas, in, in South Lamar County, outside of Pattonville. And when a, when a community is outside of a town you've never heard of, you know it is rural. <laughs> and so Shady Grove, you can see their land. So um, they've built a baseball field. And so you can see on the left side picture the church how far away it is from the backstop and notice the backstops facing the other way so that tells you how much more land they have on the other side and here's a picture of of the church with pastor susan letty and some of their some of their members and you can see the backstop on the right hand side of the church way far back and so this was a church they don't have a lot of cash they don't have a lot of resources but what they did have was land and what they did have with some kids who wanted to play ball. But the idea came because the church is located right next, well, you can see the cemetery to the right-hand side in the, of the backstop. There was a high school student that had died, and there were some students started coming, and in that area would just throw the ball to feel close to their friend who had passed. And so the idea was birthed, why don't we just build a field because the only field in the whole community is the school's field. Other, other uh, groups don't have a place to practice. Uh, if the school's not available, let's build a, a field. But let's also start a baseball ministry in the church. This uh, community is also majority Choctaw, which I didn't realize that we had a congregation in North Texas Conference that was majority Native American, but this one is. And they want to be able, because they're right next to Choctaw County, Oklahoma, um, Lamar County is. But they wanted to be able to host Choctaw gatherings, powwows, there at their community as well. And so this idea came to launch the Icona Field. They were a Spark Tank recipient, uh, uh, not last year, but the year before. And now they've gotten that up and they're, and they're building that land because they are working with what they have instead of being paralyzed about what they don't have. The next slide. Grub and Grace of FUMC uh, Archer City. Archer City did not have a lot of young people in there, but they did have a young man who was a chef in one of the hotels in Wichita Falls. He would go from Archer City and he would go over there to, to Wichita Falls. And they had hired a secretary who was a young adult. Um, uh, she's not in the picture. Uh, who was a young adult. And they said, why don't we start a cooking class for young adults and a communion meal? Now, they could have hosted that in the church, but they were thinking, uh, how many of those young adults are going to want to come to our church for a meal? But there was a newly remodeled, I believe it's called the Star Hotel in downtown Archer City. And so they launched this Grub and Grace where Chef Justin uh, gives his cooking demonstrations. They cook a meal and then they share. Now some of these young adults made their way into the congregation. But for others, this once a month meal, that became their church. Why? because the church just happened to have a chef. I think about when Jesus asked the disciples, have you no food? And they're like, well, this, this kid's got a couple of fish and some bread. 
And Jesus says, well, let's work with what we have. Next slide. Foster kids. Who would have thought, wow, that's our, that's our asset. But Button Memorial, United Methodist Church, I saw Melissa here. She can, if you have more questions about that, you can reach out to her. Uh, but there we have uh, this foster family. And what we're seeing is this congregation loving these children. Surrounding uh, this family with love and care. And say, might God be doing something in this? And they began to do a little research. And they began to talk with foster families. And they said the closest foster closet was... was in Wiley, Texas. And if you know where Little Elm is and know where Wiley is, that is a hike. <laughs> and so they said, let's start our own once a month closed closet for, for uh, foster families, but let's also do community. And so as, as, a, as a parent uh, of, a, of an, a, a child with whom we have lots of struggles, Finding other parents with whom you can talk and share, what a gift. And so Button Memorial launched this Buttons and Bows, where families can come and they can get physical needs met, uh, but they can also get spiritual needs met as well, which isn't that who we are as Methodists. We have kept those two hand in hand those spiritual needs and those social needs, and that's what Buttons Bow. Again, working with what they had. What do we have? We have a foster family that this church loves, and I think we have enough love to go beyond just this one family. And so they've gone beyond. Next slide. So how will you lower the barriers? Where are the people in your community? How can you get to them? How can you connect with them? What are the ministries that you're already doing that maybe you could just reframe or advertise? Uh, there's a YouTube channel I want you to write down, Chris Abbott, Pastor Chris Abbott out of Tulsa. And he is leveraging Facebook uh, with a program he calls Plan Your Visit. And he has all these videos on how to, how to reach people. And his, his, his point is... Um, if you want to go where people go, the average, uh, like, Gen X person spends 30 minutes a day on Facebook. And if you knew people were spending 30 minutes a day someplace, isn't that where you want to be? And so the Center for Church Development, we're, uh, we are piloting with a few congregations, and if you're interested in being a part of this, Go to the Chris Abbott page, start watching his YouTube videos, and if you need those, you can just email me and I can send them to you. But what he is finding that people will go, click on the ads on Facebook, and they will register to visit your church. Because they find it, many find it intimidating just to show up your church as a stranger. Whereas if they click, and then you, you communicate with them and say, I look forward to visit with you, and then you visit with them, and they have somebody there to receive them. Now, this is where this has to be done by laity. Clergy, clergy have too many things going on on Sundays to be waiting at the door for someone. Are you with me? But the laity can be waiting at the door with somebody, receiving them, and then uh, being able to show them, be able to sit with them, and then being able to follow up with them. And what he's finding is people who go through the plan your visit. Uh, 80% of them are coming back for a second-time visitor, and he says the only thing better than a first-time visitor is a second-time visitor. And so uh, we're talking about piloting with Lake Highlands. We're already going to be piloting in with Beverly Drive in, uh, in Wichita Falls. And if you're interested in being a part of this pilot, we're giving a, a micro-grant of $500 to spend on Facebook advertisement to see if what he's doing in Tulsa will work in various contexts and North Texas Conference. Again, being where, uh, let's go back to the previous slide. So going where the people are, then advertising your ministries to the community, 
converting your congregational ministries into community ministries, and then working what you have. And so for us to consider grants, uh, going to the next slide, here are the four things that we're looking for. One, are you gathering new people? Are you discipling people you're not already discipling? Two, connected with the United Methodist Entity. We heard a report this morning from uh, Wesley Rankin. Wesley Rankin has a, uh, what they call their viejitos, uh, their elderly persons that gather every day in there at Wesley Rankin, and they play a lot of bingo and dominoes and other things like that. But I provided an Ash Wednesday service uh, this past uh, February there. And there was such just hunger for this uh, and, and such engagement in that worship service. I, I pitched to Shelly. I said, wow, why don't you go for a micro grant and then maybe see if you can find some of the, the Spanish-speaking pastors around and give them 50 bucks to come over and provide a service uh, for your viejitos once a week. And so she did that. And so that's an example of adding spiritual ministries to uh, a community ministry. But it's a United Methodist entity, and so that means churches, uh, um, some of our Wesley Foundations. The third is disciples new people, and I'm going to speak more about that, and then meets regularly. Uh, the one-time shot is usually not very effective at discipling people. When Wesley was doing his field preaching, his goal of field preaching was to get people connected with their class meetings. So class meetings, we, we tend to think of Sunday as the, as the door that enters people into our small group. Wesley saw the small groups as the door which enter people into the big group. Did you hear me? We've gotten into the habit of thinking our big group is, where, is our doorway into the small groups. Whereas Methodism and Christianity started with the small groups, it may be a big event that gets them in the small group, but it's the small group that gets them into the big group. And that's where we're, we're moving with this. And so it needs to meet at least once a month. Next slide. So the discipleship pathway. This is generally, the, this is the most important component of, of reaching new people, but it's often the weakest in what we're seeing in our applications. How is it that people are entering into a pathway of discipleship, of Wesleyan spiritual formation? Next slide. So it is not simply an invitation to Sunday worship. Our community events, we do want an invitation to Sunday worship, but it may not be what is going to be most effective. Um, at, at Winsboro, United Methodist Church, Winsboro is, and the, there's a pastor right there, will you? We stand away there. If you want to know more about this, she can tell you all about it. So at, at Winsboro, uh, motorcyclists and other people are coming to their downtown. And so their downtown is busy on Saturdays and on Sundays. And so there are persons there that are patrons, and they have to work on Sundays. There are no more blue laws in Texas. I don't know if you People are working on Sundays, and they cannot make it to church. And so, is, is it on Mondays that you're having that? This is Debbie Lyons? Friday. On Fridays. All right, I had the date wrong. And so, on Fridays, she is gathering with, the, with these business people and then having a little small worship service with them. It may feel more like a coffee club, but it is where these persons are receiving the good news of Jesus Christ. When I was at Christ Foundry, there, there was a church that came to us and wanted to rent space. And I was like, ah, I don't want to rent space to another church. It, you know, it'll feel like competition. It could be confusing with people. And they're like, well, no, uh, we're just uh, mainly Guatemalan restaurant workers. And we want to worship at 1130 p.m. on Sundays after our restaurants close. And I was like, nah, it's not going to be competition for the people I'm trying to reach. <laughs> And with the exception of a, a chair that was moved every now and then and a check that was, in, that was left with us, I didn't even know that they were there. But finding out where and when we can reach people. Remember the, the catch-up. We can't wait for people to come to the factory on our terms and on our opening hours. We must find ways to reach them on their terms and their time. Going to the next slide. It is not simply a Bible study, even though it could be. So the seed that we've talked about, that is a new church plant that's being birthed uh, in what used to be Pleasant Mound United Methodist Church, 
they launched Bike in the Park. And so the pastor likes to bike. So again, work with what you have. The pastor likes to bike, and so the pastor started doing advertisements. We're going to be biking. We're going to be biking. We're going to be biking. And the pastor opens up and receives the people, shares what he's doing, uh, as, that he's starting a new church, and then, you know, invites people to, uh, uh, in t to reflect and to con converse as they're riding their bike. And then they ride through the park, and then on the other side of the park, they have a concluding liturgy. Now, when I say concluding liturgy, it's not, let us all stand and recite. But it is a, uh, I'm glad that you were come today. Uh, I pray that God, weren't you? What, what prayer petitions do you have? And that's becoming church for people, but it's also building relationships and connecting people with one another. Again, some of those people may find their way into your Sunday worship, but for others, this is going to be their church. The Christ Foundry, Mas Que Pan, is run by my mother-in-law, and still run by my mother-in-law, even though I've not been in Christ Foundry for, for six years. She has stayed, and what they do with Mas Que Pan is on Mondays, they go to all the community, the, the grocery stores around, and they collect the day-old bread that didn't sell over the weekend. And they bring that collection out. People come uh, from, the, from the community on that Monday morning. They have a brief prayer. And my mother-in-law shares in less than five minutes the message of the sermon of the day before. Praise over the meal, over the bread, and then people take the bread, and then they go. They're also invited to stick around and help clean the church up from after Sunday. And it is interesting how many people stick around and clean even though they don't come to the church because they feel like, hey, I have a gift. I'm appreciative of this church, and I can give back. I had one lady tell me that she just did it out of spite because she didn't want to feel like a freeloader when she came to get free bread. <laughs> and she eventually found her way and is a leader into, in Christ Foundry uh, today. But at the end of that, my mother-in-law says, tomorrow... At this same time, we're going to be having a Bible study, and I want to invite you all to it. So just the bread and a five minutes uh, reflection a disciple does not make. But we want to be conscious in all of our activities, what is the discipleship pathway? How can we invite people to go deeper? And so those persons who are there on Mondays are invited back Tuesday at the same time in the same place, but without the bread, to go deeper into a Bible study. And that is one of the most profound uh, disciple-making pro uh, um, projects in, in Christ Foundry. When I left Christ Foundry, Amy Spohr says, says, uh, Owen, I know you and your wife can't be here, but can your mother-in-law stay? <laughs> and I said, yes, she can. <laughs> and so we'll, we'll go to the next slide. So I want you to think about how can you lower the barriers? How can you get your product, which I know it feels just maybe ickier or, uh, to talk about the gospel as a product, but, but how can we get what we have been given to those who need it. Rather than waiting for people to come to the factory the one hour that's open, how can we move out and how can we reach people? How can we lower those barriers? And now we'll finish up, go to the last slide. Um, we do have time for questions and comments, but I don't know if uh, we do that. But I want to go back and, and just say, please sign the, the planting pledge. We're going to be uh, following up with each of you so that we can find out what are the experiments that you're doing. Um, there's the QR code. As I teach in class in evangelism in both courses study and I, I see Martha Hagen who's a former student and some other students that were here, what I have them do in the course of the semester is they have to design a ministry for their church to reach people they're not currently reaching. Martha designed one last summer, and she's launching it uh, this year. Uh, it, it launched in May. Oh, my. So if y'all didn't hear, so this was what she did in class last summer. She designed this, 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 this program to reach their neighbors, and they just launched in May, and they had 35, and they're already having 35 persons attending. 
And this is not a large church, so reaching 35 new people, that is noteworthy for the church. We have had just so many amazing ideas, and I know that God's going to move in your community, move in your church for you to work what you have, to work the gifts that you have that connect in the mission field uh, that God has entrusted you with. And we want to learn about what you're doing, uh, and we want to be able to share it uh, with others and share it uh, at the next uh, annual conference. So what questions or comments do you have right now? And if you have questions and comments about the CCD report, yes, in the back. Speak up loud, please. Speak loudly, please. Uh, my, my counterpart in the Great Plains Conference, um, who does church development there, he says, I have found the secret to church growth. So all of us other developers are like, yes. <laughs> he says, the church has to want to grow. It sounds obvious, but we just heard a story of uh, how true it is that the church has to want to grow. And we know as we grow, we change. And many people are at the church that they're at because they like it how it is. But we know growth brings change. And if you're bringing a bunch of young people, they're going to change your church. If you've ever had kids, you know they change your life. Same thing in a church, but I now know, I was like, why don't you want to name it? This is a great story without a happy ending. Other questions, comments? Yes. Uh, so the question is about insurance, which I'm not an expert on insurance, but I would say definitely check with your insurance when you're doing new activities that could cause uh, uh, people getting hit by baseballs. <laughs> yeah, just check with your insurance. But yeah, but having senior season come exercise, I've, you know, so we're getting, we've put in for a million and quarter uh, Lilly Grant Foundation to help churches leverage early childhood education for discipleship. Whether we get it or not, it's dependent on how hard you're going to be praying for us. Actually, I don't, I don't know if we're going, I don't know if we're going to get it or not, but we've, uh, we've applied for these funds. But I've also thought about, um, so as Diana Masters, who used to work in our office, she was caring for her mom, and she was, she was putting her mom in, in, in elderly care for, you know, a few hours a day for them. To, and I was thinking, well, there may be a place for churches to do that, which is both disciple-making as well as income-generating. And so um, we're exploring uh, those things and how can we help churches with that. And so stay tuned for that. Sign the planting pledge, and we'll keep you updated. Other questions, comments? Yes, sir, in the back. Pastor Chris up here, Chris Dowd. Oh, Abbott. Abbott, yeah. Chris Abbott and Tulsa. And so if you're interested in doing that, uh, uh, there it is. Hey, Church Growth Agency, that's him. Um, he does very interesting work, and we're, we're trying to explore, is that going to work in our churches? He does great YouTube videos, but does it work? I would like to know here in North Texas Conference. And so watch his videos. 
And if you want a micro grant to, put some, to try some of that, and he explains how to do uh, Facebook advertisement, how to do uh, Instagram advertisement. And, you know, we, we just heard this morning about how much uh, time people are spending. And we have to be present for people. We have to be where they are. And if they are on social media, we need to be there too. And so he's somebody who can equip us to do that. Other questions or comments? Hearing none, I thank y'all for coming in here today for your desire to reach people that you're not currently reaching and know that the Center for Church Development wants to help you, wants to equip you. Uh, we have the micro grants and the new spaces grants. We'll be having the spark tank that will be coming around and we have a fantastic team that wants to connect with you. And so as we close off, I want to close off with, uh, with a prayer. So let us pray. Merciful God, I just thank you for these saints. And for the way that you are moving in their lives and moving in their hearts to reach a world that is in, in need of them. Lord, we reach out to others. Lord, not because the church needs them, but we reach out, Lord, because we know that they need you. And Lord, we know that we need you. And so we come to you asking you for, to move in our hearts and move in our minds so that we as your body can reach out and, and touch lives and be a part of your healing of our land. I pray your blessings, Lord, upon each here and upon the congregations that they represent. I pray that you prosper them in this new season as they bless those who are around them and those who, they, who are in their mission field. And I pray this all in the name of the one who loves us, in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, man. Thank you all again for coming. God bless you all.
Phoebe Hutchins, Metro District Rep on the core leadership team and member of St. Louis Community, would you open this, open this session in prayer for us? Where's Phoebe? There she is. This session is now in session. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Phoebe. I'm going to take a moment of personal prayer. Is Bishop McKee here? Not yet. Well, while he, while he comes in, I'm going to take a personal privilege to introduce our, uh, our administrative, our executive administrative assistant to the Episcopal office. Deborah, would you come, come, come here a second? Let's, let's, let's recognize you. Joel Stanislaus worked for the North Texas Annual Conference of 22 years. And now she's at Perkins, and so Deborah will, will be filling uh, that vacancy excellently, may I add, on July 1. So this is Deborah Meyer. And thank you. Deborah was formerly at Lover Lane United Methodist Church, and so she comes with a very high recommendation from Stan Copeland. And so, Deborah, I'm looking forward to working with you, all right? So when you call the Episcopal office, this is Deborah, all right? Thank you, Deborah. All right, is Bishop McKee in yet? If not, uh, I recognize Dr. Ron Henderson, and we'll just move on from there. Ron? For the report on DEI, the journey towards racial justice. Reverend Sylvia Wayne will go. And Reverend Sylvia Wayne, yes, <laughs> thank you. Bishop Sines, members of the North Texas Conference and friends at the conference, it is great to be with you this year. My name is Sylvia Wang. I serve as chair of the North Texas Conference Journey to a Racial Justice Team. I am really excited that I'll be serving as associate pastor at Lake Highlands United Methodist Church starting July 1st. Currently, I am also a doctor of ministry student at Duke Divinity School. Yay, go Duke! <laughs> For the written journey to a racial justice report, I invite you to peruse these materials in your annual conference workbook after my presentation. To start, I have a story for you from the Bible. Let us travel to the book of Genesis. We hear of Abraham and Sarah. We hear about an enslaved young woman named Hagar. When Hagar was in the wilderness, she was in despair about her life. She was pregnant and would give birth to Ishmael, a son of Abraham. While in the wilderness, Hagar encountered God. Genesis chapter 16, verse 13 states that Hagar named the Lord who spoke to her. You are Elroy. For she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Elroy are Hebrew words that translate to 
God of seeing or God of God who sees. The echoes of El Roy resonate in my mind. God who sees. God who sees each of us. God who sees you. God who sees me. God who sees me when in my life there are people who do not see me. What I mean is that have there been times when I have not been seen? Are there some of us here who can relate? Have we experienced encounters with people when we have not been seen? Maybe we were not heard. Maybe we were not acknowledged for our work. Maybe we were not valued for who we are. For who we are as God has created us. Maybe others have chipped away at our dignity and humanity and treated us as lesser humans. Maybe we have looked down on other people because they are different from us in thinking, appearance, physical features, language, and color. We need to remember that we are all God's children. We are same, and we are not the same. We are all human. God also has gifted us with a variety of hair colors, features, skin tones, cultures, and personal and ethnic backgrounds. God sees us and values us. We are all, all made in the image of God. We need to treat one another with dignity, value, and respect. In my personal and professional experiences, I have encountered people who celebrate who I am. I have also encountered experiences and people who did not see me, people who defined me based on what they think I should be. I have encountered people who have belittled me because I am not white and I never will be able to be white. Some of these encounters are subtle, some are more obvious. These experiences where other people made me to be less than the full person are dehumanizing. I say this also to give voice to clergy and laity in our conference who encounter experiences where others have chipped away at the full humanity that God has given them. I say this to bring awareness and name the reality of lived experiences. We have work together to do, to see, to treat one another with the full humanity and dignity that God has given to us. Racism has no place in God's kingdom. Racism on a personal level Racism on a group level, even in churches, and racism on a larger level of scale or systems, both religious and secular, or both. Racism has no place in God's kingdom. If we call ourselves Christian, we must follow the mandate of God to love one another deeply and truly without limit. As United Methodists, we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We are all called to work for transformation of souls and lives, along with the transformation of social connections and relationships. We have together in churches, community, workplaces, and at home, not for ourselves, 
all for the glory of God, for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are called to transform groups and systems that chip away at people's humanity. We are called to take courage, to challenge words and actions and behavior that dehumanize. We are called to break and shatter the forces that hurt people on account of race, ethnicity, color, gender, sexual orientation, and other characteristics. God leads the personal and social transformation through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we need to take care. We have the capacity to hinder or support the work of God in bringing about racial justice and equity. Friends, where does this work begin and continue? The work of transformation starts with our hearts and our minds. Do we have biases? Do we have prejudices? Can we truly say in the presence of Almighty God that we see everyone, that we truly see everyone as God's beloved children, made in the image of God with the richness of features, colors, skills, talents, and full humanity that God has given? It is hard work to look within our hearts. It is hard to acknowledge that perhaps, perhaps we have contributed to hurting other people. It is hard to admit that we have not truly seen everyone. For those of you who have been hurt, know that God sees you and loves you deeply. We circle back to the echoes of Elroy, 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 God who sees. Hold on to God who sees you. Let the word of God dwell in your hearts in truth. May our hearts and minds be opened more and more to seeing people, to seeing everyone, children, adults, everyone with more respect and understanding. Let go of assumptions. Let go of your fears. Let go of being afraid. For we are free in Christ, in Christ alone. We have, by God's grace, the power to change the world. We make this journey together. The journey to our racial justice team will be con continuing to create and hold in partnership with one another opportunities so that we all can learn together and deepen bridges of understanding across cultures and races. Are you ready and willing to continue the work of building relationships with one another in our churches and communities? By the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that all of us will say to God, yes, we are ready and willing. Amen. Good afternoon. Bishop Sines, members of the North Texas Annual Conference and guests, it's very appropriate that Reverend Sylvia Wayne has gone before me for in her report, she accented the progress we have made as a conference in the journey toward racial justice and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And her report also accents to us uh, the work that still needs to be done. We also heard her pain uh, and people of color identify with that. Our vision in diversity, equity, and inclusion is to create a culture and environments in the North Texas Conference that reflect the diversity of the greater society. 
More than diversity or checking the box, we envision a culture of equity, fair, equal, and a just starting point for everyone. A just environment to live, to work, to execute ministry, to develop, to grow, to claim a bright and promising future for all members of the conference with an emphasis of creating this striving and safe culture for people of color. color. Further, this culture of diversity, equity, and belonging is not assimilating people of color to be identical to the majority, but one of welcoming and belonging just as we are, thereby enriching the whole body and reflecting God's creation and authenticity. After all, God looked at God's creation and said it was good. So each of us is endowed with the imago da, the image of God. Imagine, imago da, imago dei, <laughs> reflecting the image of God. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Reverend Wayne's report to us accents our commitment to this imperative of diversity, equity, and inclusion. A report to us also accent that there is important work to be done in creating this new culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion of belonging. We began this initiative under a different leadership, Bishop McKee, but now we even expect to go higher and further with Bishop Sines. As of today, Bishop Sines has met with most of our groups of color for discussion, affirmation, and worship. And these settings included bringing together specific groups from both Central Texas and North Texas conferences. I contend, uh, Bishop, that our bishop, I shared this earlier, is the chief diversity officer, which is a way of saying diversity, equity, and inclusion begins with the leader. If the leader wants it, it will happen. I have witnessed the change in culture on a number of points in our conference. For example, there's diversity of clergy and laity on our nominating committee. Consequently, there is racial diversity on all of our conference committees and diversities in the chairpersons and with our major committees, for example, Council on Finance and Administration. Important in the makeup of these committees is diversity within the groups themselves, rather than having the same people on several committees. We witnessed a growing culture shift in our worship service on last evening. There was diversity with people of color, and there was diversity of genre. Further, there was inclusion in the planning of such worship, like last night. Diversity is more than inviting people to the party, or rather diversity is inviting people to the party, but inclusion is inviting them to help plan the party. Last night, we got a good witness of inclusion and diversity. It is refreshing when appointments are made, and as a part of the appoint appointed cabinet, that when a person of color is being appointed to an Anglo congregation, now the conversation is not about risk, but the conversation is often about the uniqueness and the giftedness this person of color is going to bring to a, new, to a white congregation. That is refreshing to hear. It is refreshing as our center directors, as they take on their many projects, that they're very conscious and intentional in inviting people of color to be a part of all of their ministries. And they often confer with me to make certain that we are being inclusive. One thing of great importance, segments of our church, the African American church and its laity and clergy, the Latino church, were intentionally harmed because of race or language. Neither, neither of these constituents ever gave one second, one thought to disaffiliating. 
hear me well, constituent groups who were harmed because of race or language or both never considered disaffiliating from the church. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. And so since disaffiliation was not a part of our process or our future, we do not plan to be an invisible, voiceless, or powerless group, but people whose voice, creativity, color, accent, culture, life experiences are valued just as they are. We move into the future with hope. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Reverend Wang and Dr. Uh, Dr. Henderson. Bishop McKee in the, there he is. Bishop? It's somebody else's fault, but I'm right. <laughs> Y'all look very familiar, I want to say that to you. So it's good to be with you today. So Bishop Sines, thank you for the invitation and I appreciate being here representing Perkins School of Theology. And on behalf of Perkins School of Theology and Southern Methodist University, I want to bring greetings to you. In those greetings, I want to affirm something because we've discovered in our conversations around annual conferences in the South Central jurisdiction, there seems to be some confusion about SMU and the United Methodist Church. Just forget that confusion, it's not accurate. So I want to say that to you. Secondly, they still have ties to the United Methodist Church, significant ties, and those have not changed, and I do want you to know that. There have been a change in some bylaws, yes, but they do not affect our relationship in any way. That's the first thing I want to say to you today. That way I don't get caught in that conversation as I walk out of the room today. <laughs> I do want to say to you on behalf of Perkins that we do look forward to have Bishop Sines on the executive board at Perkins School of Theology. As you know, Bishop Sines is a Perkins graduate as well, has an MDiv and a DMIN from Perkins School of Theology. And in 2022, he joined a club in which I'm glad to be into. He was recognized as a distinguished alum of Perkins School of the Theology, and many of you were there that night at Perkins when that was conferred upon him. I do want to talk to you about what's happening in theological education. I will say that when uh, it became known that I was going to be serving as the interim dean at Perkins School of Theology, I have never received as many phone calls uh, since I graduated from my classmates since I graduated from Perkins School of Theology. That year was 1978, so I want to remind you what the School of Theology might have been like, what the church was like, and so many of my colleague friends from those days, they texted me or called me and said, now these are the things you need to change. <laughs> They all looked like 1975 to me. And I simply had this response. Are you still leading your church like you did when you graduated from Perkins? Friends, y'all know as well as I do, perhaps even better, that the nature of the church and the way in which we do ministry and the way we reach people who do not have a relationship with this Christ is very different today than it was 40 years ago. And what I want, why I say that is, is because none of us can be beholden to what was. We now need to focus on what will be. Mm. That being the said, that theological education will change somewhat dramatically. Yes, believe it or not, at Perkins we still teach the Bible. <laughs> And yes, we are theologically centered, perhaps as a group, because I can meet with one faculty member and I realize somebody, if somebody here is calling me, it better be that I won the lottery. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> but what I want to say to you is, is that you cannot categorize or characterize Perkins School of Theology theologically. But you put it all in a mix and you realize it feels and it's experienced much like the United Methodist Church is, or specifically to you, the North Texas Annual Conference. 
Why I say that is because we do live in a day in which people are searching. We do live in a day in which some people are very certain about what they believe, but many of us are very clear about it. And so in that clarity, we discover how it is that we navigate the faith, teach the faith, and actually begin to speak with it academically. And so Perkins School of Theology, I want to tell you, has a very interesting place that many of you may know about, but I went for the first time in January or maybe early February of this year. I took a day trip to Houston. That's about all I need of Houston, being a Dallas-Fort Worth guy, I want to say that. <laughs> But what happens there is, is very, very good. And I really am not saying that to Houston or anything else. But to say to you is, is that I went to the hybrid program there at the Houston Galveston program at Methodist Hospital in, in Houston. And I have never seen that kind of energy about a group of people who had, didn't know each other until just a few months earlier than I did that night. I listened to two faculty men, uh, members um, teach that day, Hugo Magallanes. David, tell your dad I spoke about him. And also Dallas Jingles. I ate with the students, I answered questions, and I realized that a group of people who, who covered the country all the way from Delaware to California had come to Perkins in Houston for a theological education. These hybrid models are going to probably catch on. They already are across the country, especially in United Methodist schools, and Perkins will be ahead of them. And the reason being, our goal is not to have as many people setting feet on a Dallas campus. It's as many people as we can to engage in the theological education, which I call second to none, among United Methodist schools and seminaries. And so as we begin to think about that, it will change the way we do things. We'll still be doing things in Dallas, Texas. It's not that we're running away or we're ignoring that, but it will continue. And I want to say that in 1978, I graduated, I thought, this is the greatest education I could have gotten at this time. I will say this, that kind of edu education, even somewhat differently, that is afforded to people now. This I want to tell the people of the North Texas Conference there is significant amounts of dollars in endowment funds, I'm talking about earnings, in earnings and endowment funds, they're available to North Texas Conference students who are certified candidates for ministry. Theological education is not cheap. However, there are significant resources that are available to all, and I do want you to know that we have them, and they are available to your students. Thank you. That being said, I, I want to say what uh, I would have said even several years ago to you. Somebody in your congregation really has a call to ministry, but he or she may be waiting for an affirmation from one of you. I would encourage you to have that conversation. And if you want them to have an, an even short-term experience or deeper experience, we would gladly be welcome, they would be welcomed on the campus at Perkins School of Theology. I didn't know that I would have fun doing this. But I'm having the time of my life right now. And I'm delighted about the people I get to work with, much like the people I worked with in North Texas Conference, and I'm very proud of what happens at Perkins School of Theology. Thank you for your support and your interest. God bless you. And I want to say a special word of appreciation to Bishop Reuben Sines, who I think is doing an excellent job. And I'm not checking on you every day, I promise. I just... <laughs> <laughs> I just catch snippets of the way he's leading the conference and the vision he has, and uh, Bishop Sines, I'm very grateful for you. Thank you very much. I'm grateful for you too, Thank Bishop. You. Thank you. We're gonna, we're gonna take a big photo right here. Wait a minute, let me get ready for the picture. Okay, get ready for the picture. You never know what there's gonna be. You never know. <laughs> Could we put you on that so I'll look taller? <laughs> 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 Thank you, good to see you too. All right, friends, we're going to move into our second keynote address, so I'm going to have Trey and Akilah move 
up with our Gen Z panelists. people good work you nailed good it work, well done good work That's exactly right george is not blushing at all no you played it cool you played it very cool this is that gen z zoo we were talking about earlier that we were definitely not going to take you to just uh no you all have been incredibly gracious already just to give us your time and um you know we're going to we're gonna practice that thing where it's like we're talking to each other, but we know there are a thousand people watching us, and Fourth we're gonna pretend like that's normal, <laughs> right? Does that? That's right. It's just us right here. This is the kitchen table. Just, it's us. just us. And George's friends. And George's course. friends. It's, it's just the fourth wall. <laughs> <laughs> just breaking the fourth. Um, I, I do wonder. Um, could you all just do a, uh, a, a just a quick introduction? Who you are, where you're coming from, and then we'll pepper you with questions until somebody says uncle. Does that sound okay? Yeah. You want to kick us off, oh, Georgia? Okay. Um, as some of you may know, uh, I'm Georgia. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, let's see. I'm from Vista Ridge, UMC. I am serving as the CCYM president for this year. Uh, a little bit about me. I am the vice president of the Advanced Productions uh, at my school, I want to go into political science or ministry. I don't really know. Um, and <laughs> one of the two. And I'm also a strong supporter of the Gay Straight Alliance at my school. So that's a little bit about me. Welcome, George. Um, I'm Shirley Ramirez. I am currently working for Project Transformation North Texas as one of their program quality coaches. I am currently over Owenwood Family Farm and Space, Crocker Hill, and The Seed United Methodist Church. And a fun fact, I am also currently a emergency medical technician. Uh, I do that on the side. It's an interesting side job to do, but uh, one thing that I am pursuing is nurse practitioner in pediatric ICU, so heading towards that route soon. Welcome. It's always hard to follow up after those people. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everybody. My name is um, Isaiah McDaniels. I now go by Zay McDaniels, um, just for short. Um, I have grown up in various different types of churches. Um, uh, Custer United Methodist Church was definitely my youth church and uh, my family, so um, shout out to you guys who are sitting out there in the audience. Um, currently, I serve at Project Transformation as well as a program quality coach um, serving at um, New World, uh, Casa Emanuel, and also um, Oak Haven United Methodist Church. So um, I've been serving with them for the last four years. This is my fifth year now. Um, I have started taking a couple college courses, still figuring out what I want to do next in my life, but um, I realize that I have my whole life to figure that out, so. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is uh, Nathan Lewis, and I just graduated from the University of Texas Boston, how come? And I currently work as a research specialist for Gartner, uh, working on research around DEI at the highest levels in the corporate world and executive teams, and I just love, love um, the conversation that we all had earlier. Welcome. Thank you. Zay, yes. did I get it right? Okay. Yes. All right, y'all, so the, our first question is really, I mean, it's a deep one. This All is, right? so is hard-hitting so journalism. Get, I mean, we're gonna come out the gate with the, uh, it's mostly for Trey, because um, he's building his playlist. 
and he needs he needs cool songs. So what are y'all listening to right now? Because like, cur currently it's all like late nineties, early two thousands, and it needs help. Yeah. So like, if we had your phone, we put it down. What are you listening to? Right now it's Disney music because I'm playing <laughs> that for kids all over sites. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I'm a big, huge Disney fan, so I'm right now listening to a lot of Disney music um, and musicals because I like to sing and do performative arts. Um, so you might find a lot of that stuff in my playlist. What's the top one, like top musical right now? Um, well, I did just go see the new Little Mermaid movie, so I'm listening to like the Scuttlebutt and things like I that. I told y'all. Um, that's just one of those things that was really interesting to me. So Yeah, anytime you want to bust out in song, we're here for it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Let's see, Shirley, what are you listening to? I am currently listening to a, so my playlist is a very much big mixture of everything except for country. You will never find a country <laughs> song in my playlist. I can't get into it. I'm sorry, I just can't do it. There's maybe like two country songs. I'm so sorry, Georgia. <laughs> There's like two country songs on it, maybe, but I listen to a lot of R&B, especially Cleo Soul, Young Love. It's a really good song. Young Love. All right, who sings Young Love? Cleo Soul. Cleo Soul. Yeah, we got Cleo Soul. Thank okay, you. we're writing that down. In the old ears. Sorry about that. No, it's yeah. good. It's Presbycusis. <laughs> Nathan, what are you listening to? Um, so I kind of just bounce from artist to artist. I love musicals. Yeah. Um, so definitely Hamilton comes up all the time randomly. Mm -hmm. um, but right now I'm listening to Noah Khan and uh, just having his album on, his new album on repeat. I think he just really captures Peter through those words to our kind of mental experience of young people. Um, and it's really, really captivating to listen to. Nice. Good. Georgia. Um, let's see. I listen to a bunch of mixtures of artists. I listen to a lot of like Kendrick Lamar, uh, um, Tyler the Creator, uh, Mac DeMarco. Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about up there. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> um, there was, oh, Steve Lacey, mm -hmm, he's good. Um, and yeah, that's really the, the top artist on my new summer playlist, so, yeah. What's the name of the playlist? Yeah, could oh, you tell us? Don't worry, it's uh, Summa with an A. <laughs> Summa 23 Jams. <laughs> Thanks for that, that was helpful. That's definitely, yeah, it was very, very helpful. Um, okay, one of the things that gets tossed around quite a bit, this is certainly a, sort of a big part of the broad conversation is self-care. And uh, I guess my question for you all is, every, you know, everybody seems to, sorry for my, my mic, I'm not doing very well there. Um, everybody defines self-care in their own way. I'm just curious what it looks like for each of you in your own lives. Um, Shirley, how do you feel about kicking us off here? I go to sleep. Uh, sometimes I just don't know how to stop working, so my, bo my body physically is just shuts down. It's just like, all right, it's time to go to bed, and I don't wake up till like, the next work day, because sometimes that's all you really need. Just go to sleep, do your face wash, <laughs> make sure you put on your sunscreen before you get out into this Texas heat. Do it all over again. I like it. I love it. Skin I love care, it. nap time. Skin care matters. Yes. Isaiah, how about you? Um, so for me, I mean, yeah, self-care wasn't something I really practiced until a couple of years ago, because um, I also am a very hard worker, constantly going. Um, so I would say sleep too, but sometimes just um, watching a good TV show. Like I'll just sit there and like binge watch a show, um, which is rare right now. But like, like my body knocked out, went to sleep for 15 hours like the other day because I guess I needed it. But um, yeah, like I'll just be watching like Grey's Anatomy or I'll be watching. Um, currently, I'm watching Good Trouble. So like whatever, just. I've been watching the Golden Girls a lot too, <laughs> so that's just something <laughs> I like watching. Good, good. Nathan, how about yourself? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think self care is really important, and um, I think that young people as a as a whole are taking a good intentionality of focusing on that. And for me, I think that you know spiritual self care, mental health care, and physical health care all are intimately intertwined. Um, and the way in which I kind of, my, my go-to cure um, is playing pickup basketball, um, which for me is where I can just go and relax and get exercise and kind of uh, clear my soul. And it's just um, great to do that, especially I've been in Austin for the past uh, five years and have a great community there. And 
and it's just a wonderful happy place to enjoy the Oklahoma City. Good, thank y'all. That's good stuff. We learned about skincare, uh, lots of napping, which I am here for. So thank you. Um, oh, Georgia, you got some good stuff. Um, yeah, uh, I see like self care more as like a mental thing, and so like. What I do is I either go hang out with my friends or I read a book laying out in the sun or I listen to music. I really love music, so, yeah. Good, good. good. Um, Georgia and Nathan, you talked about uh, community. Um, tell us about your community. Who are your people? Georgia, we've met some of yours. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's my people up there. <laughs> um, yeah, I have my church people and then I have my at-home people. Um, and then, yeah, my church people specifically, I love my church people. Um, recently one of my friends passed away from suicide and, uh, my church was really, really there for me and it was so amazing and I wouldn't trade my church community for the world. So. Who else would like to share? I feel like I have so many people everywhere. Sometimes it can be overwhelming. Um, like I love people and. Um, like I have people from, like I work two jobs. So I work the, this wonderful nonprofit that I've been working with, but I also work at this place called Camp. Um, it's here in Dallas. Um, <coughs> it's like a really cool tricked out toy store. Um, they have like some sort of interactive theatrical performance that goes with it. Um, so I like have people from work and different aspects of my life. Um, I have obviously my church home, friends, um, my family members, <laughs> sorry. Um, and then just like I said, the friends that I've made over the years, those are like kind of my people. So um, when I really need someone to like lean on, I feel like I can reach out to somebody and usually they're there. Nathan? Yeah, I think for me, um, it really starts with my family. I've been really blessed to have an incredible family that supports me and loves me in all that I do. Um, as I said, I've been in Austin for a while. I um, grew up not just around Dallas, so I have great friends. Um, in both areas that I just enjoy spending time with. And I'm also blessed um, to have an incredible partner um, who I love very much and um, who uh, supports me and loves me and believes me as well. So that's kind of my, my community. Good. Shirley, how about you? So I have my family. And so my father recently passed away last year. And uh, working with PT, I grown a second home, a second family. So. They're like my brothers and sisters, so many of them. They also act like your younger siblings, so literally act like a younger brother and sister. They're like, why haven't you called me? <laughs> I was like, you just told me five minutes ago. But no, they're amazing. Honestly, I don't think I would have gotten to a lot of places that I'm here now without them. I love them so much. So I know, I don't know if some of them are in here in the room, but if they are, they're probably hearing this. But I tell them this all the time either way. So. Um, okay, a question we're a little bit curious about. You all have heard, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of Gen Z, where people tend to talk about that generation a little bit. Maybe that's come across your news feed at some point. I'm curious how you feel about the ways Gen Z is spoken about. Descriptions, characteristics, attributes, where it feels like, yeah, I feel represented by that, or my circle of friends feel represented by that, and then the opposite, where it feels like, no, that's not me, that's not you know, my experience at all. And anybody who has something, please just, I mean, I'll start by saying, like, I feel like I'm a, a cusp of Gen Z and millennial. Um, I was born in 1995, so, like, I'm really, like, right there. Um, but I did hang out with a lot of people who were younger than me, so, like, the grades lower than me. Um, and so, like, part of me feels like when Gen Z is brought up, like, I can relate to some of the things, but then also I know that there's a part kind of on the further side before you jump into Gen, is it Alpha? Mm -hmm. So my, my younger sister who's eight, like, that's a whole different generation. So like. I don't know, I feel like I get a chance to kind of see, um, get to see between the cracks sometimes. So like I can see sides on an upper level or on a like lower level, so I, I feel like I'm constantly in the middle. Sounds good to me. I was so on the cusp and um, for years, most of my life, I desperately wanted to be a millennial because, <laughs> you didn't <want> to <laughs> because, <laughs> Because in, uh, in the circles I've 
was in, it seemed as if uh, Gen Z was an insult. Um, mm. That it was sort of a way of telling someone, not really your time yet, probably shouldn't say anything. Um, and just kind of viewed as being overly kiddish. Mm. Um, and so for me, I definitely want to be a millennial because all millennials are adults. Gen Z are kids. Mm. Um, and now realizing that there are Gen Z people who are even older than I am, um, definitely all adults, um, and have so many wonderful things to offer, including just to be plugged here. Uh, it, it, I'm proud to be Gen Z now, but I think for a long, long time, there were a lot of connotations that I ran far, far from and would much rather have been a millennial. Yeah. I was going to say, oh, okay, sorry. I didn't know if the mic was on. So a lot of what I hear and a lot of what I've seen about Gen Z that I do agree with is that we are the generation of movement, whether it be good or bad. Sometimes cancel culture is a one big thing that we did start at the beginning of COVID. I don't agree with everything that we've canceled, but we are a generation of large movement. We are a generation that we don't sit down and take everything that is get given to us. We, if we want something done, we will get it done in one way or another. We use our platform of social media now to give us a voice and give others a voice. And that's how I see Gen Z. And one thing I don't agree with is something that I hear a lot is we don't know what work is or we don't work, which we do. Some of us don't know how to sit down. <laughs> um, I. I hear a lot of the time that Gen Z is the generation that's gonna change the world, and I 100% agree with that. I think what's upcoming and the future of Generation Z is going to shock everyone in this room because there are some powerhouses in our generation. Um, but then I've also heard that we're just like the generation that's like addicted to their phones, which like I get that, but also at the same time, like so are millennials and so are Gen X and so are, <laughs> Boomers, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I add something to that? So, <clears throat> when I, <clears throat> hi. <laughs> so when I think about the whole phone thing, like I think about like people are always like, oh yeah, we're on our phones, but like we've learned to innovate with our phones. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're not just able to just be completely connected. Like the way I'm able to multitask while having my phone in my hand. I remember growing up, I was not the kid or the friend in my group who like was always on their phone. In fact, like I would forget I had it. And then I became an adult and had to start doing things on my own. And I realized I really need this thing to like keep my life on track and like keep up with things. So if I'm not answering an email, a phone call, a Slack message, um, a text, which I don't like to text. I like to physically talk to everybody. I don't know if anyone else is out there like that, but I feel like I can get a whole conversation done in like five minutes rather than like spending all day long trying to text like 16 different people. It's just a lot. So I don't know. I feel like. When they say we're glued to our phones, as long as we're still getting the work done, then why not have the phones like accessible to do other things? Okay, I think that's really helpful. I actually want to ask a little more on that. Um, and we talked about it earlier. Um, a lot of technology is, uh, relatively speaking, really new. Mm. And I'm wondering if you all feel like, I mean, it sounds like what you're just describing is the good and, and possibly the bad as yeah. well of technology. Do you all feel like, is that a conversation in your circles about how to engage with a phone or how to engage with social media or how to not? Do you feel like people are getting nuance that is healthier? How? I feel like, I'll just um, to keep going on that. I'll just say like, I think there again, with every good thing, there's always a bad part of it. Um, so like, depending on how you're spending the time, like there are certain places, there's a time and place for it too. I think that's the kind of key part there is like, when you are in those times and moments where you're not supposed to be on it just because you really need to be fully present, like those are those times. Um, I feel like it has also kind of affected sometimes the way I communicate with people in a, like a physical sense because like I will have to like innately like tell myself, okay, don't go to my phone, like be here, be present in this moment. Um, because like Shirley said, really hard workers constantly working and being on my phone um, doesn't always mean I'm very fully present all the time. Anybody else? Any sort of nuance around technology and social media that feels like, oh, we're learning how to do this in a healthier way? I, mean, I, would, I would just add that I think technology and social media is a tool, and that tools aren't a new thing, and that people use tools to do good, people use tools to do evil, <laughs> people use tools to waste time. I don't think that any of that is a, a novel concept. I think 
think that technology allows us to connect people we never would have connected with, um, it allows us to do things that otherwise would have been impossible, and it also allows us to do untold harm to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a balance in everything, and it really comes down to how we use it. And I think that Gen Z has figured out how to use it for a lot of good, and also figured out how to do it for a lot of harm. Um, and so I think just like any tool, um, we can't really look and blame the tool because the tool is neutral, it's how we use it. And so I think that the, that's a, a way in which I view technology. Well, the great power comes from yeah. Switzerland. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of things happening in the world, right? So many things, uh, so many heavy things. Um, I want to know what keeps you up at night? What are you worried about? Uh, I can start. Oh, there you go. Hello. Um, for me, I think the thing that mostly keeps me up at night is being able to like sit in my bed, watching my TV, in my blanket, with the AC on, having a nice glass of water next to me. And it's weird to think that I have all of this just at my fingertips. And then there's people out there that don't have any of it. And I think that's what keeps me up most at night, knowing that like, there's so much I can do. I'm just, I don't know how to get started. And so I think that's really something that like eats me alive while I'm trying to go to sleep. Mm. So. I think my, oh, hi. Um, I think mine is the same way. Like there's so much that I haven't done yet and there's so much that I have the potential to do. And there's so much that is sitting in the to-do list that has not been completed yet. and. I think it's just a way of, okay, I'm going to start with this task and then just work my way up. And slowly, but more, it's more advocacy. It's more like, what haven't I advocated enough for yet? I would just say that for me, it feels like I'll be sitting up at night and I'll just be thinking about how people are still hurting people. Um, I feel like, you know, with all of the things that we've learned over the generations, how there are higher issues, um, specifically gun violence, like that's just been a thing. Um, I grew up in Allen, Texas, um, so anyone who's also in that area, shout out to y'all. Um, but when that happened, um, my brother, he just moved to Frisco, uh, Richardson, but he lived there and um, he frequents hanging out there. So it definitely was one of those things where it kind of took pause for me. Um, and it's hard because you just never know when, where, and why. Um, and there's other things too in terms of just like children and protecting children, like how that's still such a hard concept to do. And there's just so many things that we say we don't know, but we also know so much more now than we did before. So like I know that there's, there's work being done, but I think that's what keeps me up at night. It's just like how close are we to really coming to the other side of things where it's not still so prevalent and getting worse mm -hmm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree. Um, it's guns. I um, know that over the past few years, it has begun to really permeate every decision that I make. If I want to go in public, if I want to see a movie, if I want to go to the mall, you have to really ask yourself, is this worth dying for? And as I think about having children in the future, um, a question that really keeps me up at night is I love my family a lot and I live all here. Can I raise my kids here? And the answer right now is no. Um, I don't feel like kids are safe here. And um, I think at this point, the way in which I've just come to rationalize the idea is that every day it's going to happen. And I just hope that I'm not there and someone I love isn't there. And that's just gonna happen the next day, the day after that. And if you think more than that, it can be crippling. Um, not really wanting to go anywhere, do anything. And that's really what leads to sleepless nights, is gun violence. Thanks for that, Christian. Uh, as far as you are comfortable sharing, I'd actually like to hear a little bit about how you all relate to the church or religious or faith life these days. And, um, you know, if it isn't sort of a, 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 a church setting, then I'm just wondering how you get, I'll say, your spiritual itches scratched. 
Uh, does that make sense? Hmm. I mean, I'll say this. Um, I'm not much of a church goer anymore, um, other than within my work, um, being in those spaces, spending times like this where I'm getting a chance to be a part of the church. Um, because I think a lot of the time I am spending that time working um, to support myself. Um, and that can be hard. But I think because I'm so busy and I spend that time, I'm always like talking with God. I'm like, Lord, help me in this situation that I'm about to go through. Um, and then I just do a lot of praise too whenever like I see his deliverance like through hard, hard and tough situations. Um, so for me personally, like that's kind of where I keep my faith and my beliefs kind of within myself. Um, also trying to accept things about myself that I'm like, you know, I'm not fully sure about and understand why these are the things they are, but that is just what it is. And so having that kind of personal conversation with God rather than having to hear from so many other people's opinions and thoughts and things, like it just makes it easier for me to be able to say, okay, this is where I'm okay and this is where I'm hoping to go forward. And um, I'm open, um, you know, I'm not really shying away from being out there and present, it's just more so taking my time and realizing it's my life, my journey. So. I can go next. Uh, I'm a PK, for those of you that don't know. Um, Ashley Ann Sipe is my mom. And so I spend quite a bit of time at church. But I, I, think, <laughs> I think that even if I wasn't a PK, um, I'll start off saying this. Whenever I was younger and I was not United Methodist, I was Southern Baptist, I did not enjoy going to church at all. It seemed like a burden, and I was that kid in the back of the church that just colored and then would cry. Um, and then whenever I went to my first United Methodist camp, it was Bridgeport. Woo -woo. <laughs> um, whenever I went to Bridgeport for the first time, I had my first God moment, I guess you could say. Um, and ever since then, I've never wanted to not have moments like that. Um, I spend a lot of time praying, and I see God mostly in like sunsets. Um, and what I said earlier uh, to Trey and Q, um, the world could be falling apart, like literally crashing on me. And if there was a pretty sunset, I would still believe in God. God is always within the sunsets for me, and I see him every night, so. I can go next. Um, so I don't have a certain denomination that I identify with, so I guess you would define that as agnostic? I'm not too sure with terms, but it's because when I was younger, we would church hop a lot, and I was also the kid that would only sit quiet at church because my mom whispered to us, if you guys sit quiet, we'll go buy McDonald's fries after church. <laughs> so you know I sat very quietly, not paying attention to anything just because I wanted McDonald's. But uh, in the future, we ended up going to a different church and we stayed there for 10 years. That church uh, was very harmful to my spirit. And um, so currently in a healing process of a spiritual church journey, so currently going to CFound, Christ Founder United Methodist Church with Pastor Amy. I hear her somewhere. There she is. Yeah. So they've helped a lot in the healing process. And so I do pray a lot. I pray with any moment that I can. I've been found praying in the car a lot because that's where I am most of the time because of work. But um, again, I try to do a lot of things on my own so when it comes to a lot of spiritual work i try to navigate it on my own so i don't really try to follow certain denominations just because it does get confusing i've noticed but that's how that is right now as uh, some of you know from yesterday um the last few years have been uh, a difficult journey in terms of the church and um, but I did want to say, I think the second part of the question is really important in terms of staying connected with Jesus and connected with God, um, even if not entering into the physical space of the church. And something that I've always um, believed, and it's rooted in the fact that for much of my early childhood, I was a part of a church plant, but I didn't have a building, is that the church is people, and 
that I'm very blessed to have some amazing people in my life who have continued to be my church and have continued to show me Jesus and to, of course, to talk about Jesus and talk about his love and his mission, um, even if not physically being in um, a place of the steeple. And so that has been really encouraging to me at this point. That's great. So we have time for one more question. A um, little while ago, Terry and I were talking about folks who have invested in us, especially when we were younger, um, who like gave us the keys to the church or gave us an opportunity or a chance. And we thought, are you kidding me? Us? Me? Really? Okay. Crazy person. Sure. Um, but then we realized that those folks really, like they invested in us. They trusted us enough to give us a chance, give us an opportunity. So here's our last question. Who has invested in you? Even when you didn't see why they were investing in you. But maybe you did, maybe you did. But feel free to shout them out too, especially if they're in the room, make them blush a little bit. Who invested in you? I can start with this one. Um, uh, I'll give a little background story. So for the past four years, I have ran for student body president, or class president, and um, I won one time. And the last three I have lost, which it's okay. It's all right. I keep saying it's a sign from God, but you know, maybe, yeah. Anyways, um, <laughs> but uh, the Monday after I found out I had lost, I went back to school and I was so sad. And I had spent the week before doing so much campaigning that I had fallen behind in most of my classes. Um, and so I was really stressed and I was actually crying in one of my classes whenever I got a call from my mom and she was like, guess what? And I was like, girl, what? I'm crying in class. <laughs> and she said, uh, Emma Williams and Joseph Bradley, shout out, um, picked you to be the CCYM president. And I was like, a president? Let's go. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was really like, me? Okay, cool. I don't really understand why me, but thanks. Um, so yeah, thanks guys. I don't know if Emma's in here, but thanks to you too. Oh, thanks girl. <laughs> I can go next. Um, hello? Okay. So, uh, she is currently working in PT Arkansas and she is one of the pastors there. Her name is Ellen Gotelli. Um, I don't know if many people know her, but she is great. I love Ellen Gotelli. Uh, she was one of my light coordinators. If you don't know what light stands for, it's one of the high school programs that Project Transformation works for. So they help you get through college and get uh, all of your stuff together because sometimes you're sitting there and you don't know what you're going to do with your life in high school. Uh, but she was amazing. It was not a best time in my life, but she was very encouraging in everything that I did. And so was Pastor Amy. Pastor Amy and the church, Pastor Lucy too, they were amazing, especially because they were there for me when my father was passing. Uh, but they also provided amazing food. Thank you so much. I would have been starving so many days. But they are great. They're amazing people that honestly, I would confide in and I would not be here because I would have been hungry without them. <laughs> so it's hard for me to like pinpoint specific people. I mean, like in different stages of my life, I have different people. Um, and so I'm very big on like every person that I've come in contact with has either impacted me or has impacted them. Um, so really I guess it's more specific on like, okay, when did this person impact you? Did this person impact you? Um, I will say there are a lot of people from the church um, in Exeter Road that kind of like put me on this path, I feel like. Um, Patty Scheibmeyer was uh, like a church mom to me. Um, Pastor Tim Morrison was just always there. Um, there are so many people um, that if I just started going on and on, like I'd be here rambling for, for days. Um, and then just even people that I met in the PT world where I'm just constantly like, surrounded by people who are uplifting you. Um, and making sure that you're okay. Um, and I think now that I've kind of gotten all of those mentorship, I keep thinking about like, I just want to be a mentor to other people and kind of help them invest in them um, as people have invested in me because there's so many things that I see in other people that I'm hoping that I can like 
I don't bring about, because maybe that's what it is that they kept pushing me to do. Like, I'm still trying to figure out why people will see things in me. And I'm like, I, I truly can't see them myself yet. So that's something I'm working on myself. Um, so I just shout out to those who, who know me and um, have been there and supported me in, in my life and who will be there. So I've just been in one or two churches in my life. And um, if I was to name all the incredible uh, lady and clergy who have impacted me and who are actually in this room today, um, maybe with the waiver schedule, and I know that that's very important to some people. <laughs> and so yeah. you know who you are. And um, as church is coming on, my faith never wavered because of the watering and the planting of the roots that you all did. And I'm eternally grateful for you for that. So thank you. Ideally, you, you know, you just got people who uh, invest, you know, Howard Thurman, and this is probably a uh, poorly quoted, but roughly says um, that part of ministry is giving people a crown to grow into. And that is seeing something in people before they see it in themselves so that they begin to see what you see. And that's a little bit of what you're describing, and I think this room is probably full of people who have been about that business, and somebody else has given all of us a crown to grow into as well. And so all the folks who got sort of shouted out, really grateful for you. And for our panel, um, Nathan, Isaiah, Shirley, Georgia, you are incredibly gracious and brave to do this, and we are so, so grateful. So thanks for spending your time with us. Thank you. How's that cute? Oh, we got a stand innovation? Do we stand? Do we stand? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was great. Thank you for sharing. Um, Trey and Akita will come back for the third keynote speak, but you know, we, we've learned a lot from talking, from listening to this generation, and I, I know they're going to do great things, and so how can we open the door um, for them to, to succeed. We want them to succeed wildly and to take their faith into the world, to transform the world with it. Uh, I'm going to ask Reverend, um, let me see, Ted Haynes, the new district lay leader, the new East District lay leader and member of First UMC Winsboro to come to the mic. And uh, Kenny, do we have announcements at this time? Okay. Yes, we have one uh, announcement. Uh, Patrick Booth, who is a missionary with a GBGM, uh, working with refugees and victims of sex trafficking, uh, is home in North Texas and welcomes the opportunity to talk with your church's mission team. If you're interested in that, contact Jeff Hall at Cochran Chapel uh, to schedule a visit. He's here through uh, June 21st. Is he here, like here, here, now? Where, where, where is he? So you can, is he we can know who you are. Is, is he? He's a vendor. He's a okay, okay. So at, at the G, at the G, uh, GBGM uh, site. All right.
Thank you. So after Ted Haynes um, leads us in prayer, then we're going to be dismissed to the toolbox se sessions from 4 through 5 p.m. Then we're going to break for dinner. And uh, we have ordination dinners and then the ordination service tonight at 7 p.m. Ordination service tonight at 7 p.m. Okay? So, Ted. There you are. Would you bow with me? Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for this body of believers called to be here to serve you and to glorify you. As we gather here to honor you, lead us to live and serve together in unity. We know that there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Help us to live that during the same conference as we focus and deliberate on your church and our combined role in furthering your kingdom in North Texas. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you in this way, in this place and time, and we seek your guidance. Help us to keep our mission of making disciples for the transformation of the world, especially in North Texas, in focus as our primary interest and not be distracted by differences that do not contribute to that mission. Mm. Bless our churches, our clergy, and our lady across the North, Te North Texas Conference, and lead us to achieve all that you intend for us to do to serve you, honor you, glorify you, and lead others to you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ted. Thank you for that. All right, we are dismissed now to our toolbox sessions. Um, see you tonight at 7 p.m.